Good morning. We are going to go ahead and get started uh, with our presentation on how to incorporate social media. My name is Kelly Richmond Hope, and Islam is my co presenter and Twitter friend. That's how we originally met. Uh, just by way of background, I am an accounting professor at DePaul University here in Chicago, so not too far away from where we are. We're really close to the new stadium, so I'm excited to see that when it opens. Is uh, I teach accounting, so I teach managerial accounting, financial accounting, forensic accounting, ethics and leadership, and I think that's everything. So, I um, you want to introduce yourself? Yes. So uh, again, my name is Imfan Akpan. Again, want to thank everybody for coming out to the to our presentation. I, I gotta say, Schoology, it's it's been an amazing conference. It's our first time here. Um, Met a lot of wonderful people, uh, Dave, um, Grace, so I want to thank all of them. Also, got to say I'm fired up to be here with Kelly. She's Dr. Kelly Pope, my, my mentor. Um, I'm excited for her. She has a, her film is actually um, debuting, a documentary film called All the Queen's Horses on August the 9th um, at Martha's Vineyard uh, African American Film Fest. I'm excited to be here. So we are going to start with intros and bios, um, and we're going to talk about today's class room, really from both of our experiences. And um, I teach both accounting and non-accounting majors, and so even though those two groups are different, most of them don't want to be in the classroom. They just don't like accounting. I don't know why, but I love accounting, but they don't like accounting. And um, so we're going to talk about today's classroom and some cool media resources. And then I'm going to share with you my Twitter story and how I incorporate social media in an accounting class. So if I can do it in an accounting class, I feel like you can do it anywhere. Because uh, most people just think accounting is something that it's really not. So I'm going to hopefully change your perceptions about that. And um, we'll do wrap up and then questions. So um, just by way of background a little bit more, I love teaching. Um, I took my first accounting class in high school. So I'm originally from Durham, North Carolina, and I went to Jordan High School, so I don't know if anyone is from Durham in the audience, but I took my first accounting class when I was in high school. I think I was in ninth grade, and I took it ninth, 10th, 11th, like they kept having iterations of it. And when I uh, got to my senior year of high school, I realized, yes, I want to do this. I majored in accounting, and um, went to North Carolina a t State University in Greensboro, um, then went to Virginia Tech for my master's in accounting, and then did my PhD in accounting at Virginia Tech. So I've been doing accounting for a really long time. But uh, different variations of it. Uh, but I love movies, and obviously I love accounting. And so what I wanted to do was blend all of those things in one place, because I saw the classroom shifting, and I thought, how can I make class a lot more interesting? So I started incorporating social media, I started incorporating film, and I'll show you how to do that. And I also like to write. So I have a blog on Forbes called Higher Learning. Everything I write about is about really fraud. That's my research area. So when I'm not in the classroom, I go around the country and interview white collar felons, whistleblowers, and victims of fraud who um, visit prisons. And I take all of that information and bring it into the classroom. So it really helps class become a lot more engaging. So that's a little bit about me. I always end by saying I love fraud because people think that's really weird, but it's, I'm really nosy, so I like other people's business, so <laughs> I um, use that as a way to really engage my students in class. Um, so we'll go with a little bit more about your intro. So a little bit about me, so uh, I love accounting, so as I mentioned before, I am uh, born and raised in Chicago, I'm full-time faculty at National Lewis University here, where I teach a number of business courses. My specialty is accounting, so I teach business, uh, finance and accounting. I also teach part-time at a community college here called Harold Washington. I also work part-time at another university called Robert Morris University where I'm accounting faculty there. So, so I, I love accounting, I love teaching. Before I was a teacher, I spent about 10 years working in finance um, before I moved into higher education full-time. So I gotta say I'm living the dream right now, <laughs> teaching. Um, I also love technology. Um, learning new things. Always trying to find ways of, of learning how to do things better. And I love presenting. So I love, I love coming to conferences, 
telling kids with me about it. You know, I, I love to, to do conferences and speak and just talk to people and get to know people as well. So uh, one day I was walking in my class, and so the way our classes are set up in DePaul, at DePaul, the, the uh, front door is in the back, and so you walk in the back and walk down. And so I overheard my students talking, and this was a comment that I heard them talking about someone else's class. And they said, this class is so boring that it makes me not want to be an accountant. And I just overheard that. And I was really shocked because this is one of my classes where they are accounting majors. So you would think that people are wanting to be there. And so I just started digging a little bit and asking, well, tell me what you mean by that. And they said a couple comments. I said, um, let's do a quick survey. And I don't, you don't have to put your name on it, but I just tell me about what the experience is. And so these are some of the comments that I got from the students after they started really sharing. And I promised I wouldn't tell anybody. Oh, I'm telling you, but um, you don't know them. But I, I wanted to know like what is really going on. So this is some of the feedback that they said. The professor only read text heavy PowerPoint slides. And so oftentimes with our books, um, they give us just all these instructor resources, and they're really text-heavy PowerPoint classes. So what they said is, professor stands in front of the class, and they only read text-heavy PowerPoint slides. They turn around and got it, and they keep going. And so that was just really not engaging for them. Um, so not engaging, second point. And then they said the professor just lacked passion. They didn't really seem like they wanted to be there. They just felt like they were checking the box. I did this, I'm moving on. So they lacked the passion. And then overall, they were just not inspired. And so to hear that students that are choosing accounting as a major say some of these things really got me concerned. And so I, I, wanted to want, I wanted to think, why is this? And when you think about our classroom today, at least um, at the college level, this is a really appropriate slide. Now, at the top of it, it says the generations in the workplace. But if you want to replace the word workplace with classroom, for, for me at DePaul, which is a very urban campus, this could be replaced with the word classroom. And so we have these three buckets of people in the classroom. Baby boomers typically are the ones in front of the classroom teaching, and Gen Xers and millennials are the ones in the seats. And if you look at some of the pros and cons of each, you can understand why the needs and wants of everybody is really different. So baby boomers, let's look at the pros. Productive, hardworking team players and mentors. Con, less adaptable, less collaborative. And, and whatever group you fit in, I'm just the messenger, so don't, don't hurt me. <laughs> Gen Xers, pros, managerial skills, uh, revenue generation, problem solving. Cons, less cost effective, less executive presence. Millennials, uh, pros, enthusiastic, tech savvy. And when I see that, I mean tech savvy socially, not always tech savvy academically. Uh, entrepreneurial and opportunistic. Cons, and we hear this a lot when we're talking about millennials, lazy, unproductive, and self-obsessed. Self so when you think about how our classroom shifts, everyone has a different need, right? So we're trying to think about how can I engage the people in the seats when the people at the head of the class are so different. And that's a challenge whether you're in classroom, elementary, middle school, high school. So uh, one of the things that I started thinking about is how can I increase and improve my class? And so millennial learners have really changed the way we should approach the classroom. And if you think about the little note on the side, the average millennial spends 18 hours per day consuming media. Now, if I remember correctly, there's 24 hours in a day, right? <laughs> and so if 18 hours is consuming media, how do we compete with that when we're trying to teach them something? How? It's tough, right? So what I did, and this is a story from about three years ago. I started incorporating Twitter. Now, I'm the kind of professor that I allow laptops, phones on desk, and one of the reasons is because um, I'm an urban, we're an urban campus, and so I have a range of people in my classroom. I have people that have children, people that are caring for elderly parents. So to teach a class for three hours, or even an hour and a half, and tell someone they can't look at their phone ever, it's just really unrealistic to me, so I allow those things. Now I walk around the classroom a lot, no one's shopping, no one's on Amazon, and rarely are they on Facebook, because I, I circle the room a lot, and they know I'll call them out if they do it. But I started using Twitter in my class to really engage the outside world into the class. And so, here's my Twitter story. So does anybody watch The Prophet? 
Just one, he ran back by the prophet. Have you ever heard of the prophet? Okay, let me tell you about the prophet. So write this down. This is a great show. It's like business in action. It's one of the things that I enjoy about TV, and I love watching TV and movies, is there's some really great programming on it now. And things that you can use in the classroom. So The Prophet is one of those shows. It comes on CNBC, I think it's Tuesday nights. And um, what it's hosted by this gentleman here, Marcus Lemonis, and he goes into a business. And often these businesses are failing, and they write to him, and he comes in and tries to turn the business around, makes an investment. So they talk about all of these business terms. And when I watched this for the very first time, I was like, this is like accounting in action. Because one of the things that students need to see is how this is practical. How is it applicable to the real world? Because if it's in a textbook, that's make-believe. But if it's really happening with real people, they believe it. So The Prophet is the perfect show for that. And so one of the things I like to say is the key to a good class lecture is always a good story. And The Prophet has great real stories about business. So one day, um, I was one summer, I was watching the show, and um, I was watching it on um, In Demand because I just stumbled upon it. And I was getting ready for my managerial accounting summer MBA class, and I watched the episode uh, about Key Lime Pie Baking Company. Now, I just use this as an example, but all the episodes are really good because they all go through real business scenarios. And so I saw this episode, and I thought, wow, this is great. This is this company in... Um, Florida that makes pies, and they were struggling. They wrote to Marcus. He came in. You just see for 57 minutes or 56 minutes the dynamic of the owners and Marcus, and they're talking about break even, direct materials, direct labor, manufacturing, okay, all of these things that are in the accounting book that they're closing their eyes to, but when they see it on TV, they're like, wait a minute, I actually understand what they're talking about. So I took this episode and I showed it to my class. So we watched it in class, and then um, while we were watching it, I um, bought some little key lime pie tarts that everybody had. So they were eating key lime pie, they were watching key lime pie, and so it just sort of all worked. So they were like, wow, this is neat that we're eating pie in accounting class. But it just sort of made sense. So we were watching this episode, and um, but before I went to class, of course, I watched it first. And I was like, this is great. Like, why have I not heard about this before? So I looked to see if Marcus Lemonis had a Twitter account. And so I saw that he did, and I looked at his feed. How many people have a Twitter account? Okay, great. Do you ever use it in your classes? Oh, good. Okay. Well, maybe you have a Twitter story, too. Okay, I'll show you how. So I looked to see if he had a Twitter account. And I looked at his feed. And then I looked at his comments, because sometimes people like him don't manage their own Twitter account somebody else does. So I could tell by the way that he was responding that he actually was managing his own account. So this was, what's the date of this? So a couple years, three years ago. So I sent him a message, and I, I sent him a message, and I said, wow, you know, this show is great. I wonder if, um, oh, here, this was my first tweet. Revenue, profit, margins, product cost, all discussed, and hashtag the profit. Perfect for MBA students at Mark Simona. So I took a picture. I had a small class. So I took a picture and I tweeted it to him. And um, he actually started following me. So he started following me. And so I was like, uh oh, he's opening the door. I'm start, start talking to him now. So he started following me. And he said, um, I, I said, great show. He sent back a comment, where are you located? So I said, in Chicago, would love to have you visit. And so he wrote back and said, um, send, me a, send me a note, I'll see. So I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> he said it. So because he was following me back on Twitter, he sent me a direct message with his email address on it. So uh, he said, here's my address, contact me. So I sent him an email, and um, immediately, so this was like 11.15 at night at this time, so I sent him an email, immediately he forwarded it to his assistant. She immediately responded back to me and said, we'll get this together. So I was like, okay, this is great. So from watching TV, looking up Twitter, seeing if he had an account, sending a message, because I mean, all I could do is ignore it, but he didn't. So now I'm talking to his assistant. Now, I will say, he is based in the Chicagoland area. He lives out in Lake Forest. 
but that really didn't matter. I mean, he's local, but he does travel all over the country. So I was going back and forth with his assistant for months. So it probably was, this was um, July of 2014. So we went back July, August, September, October, November, December, just back and forth trying to get on his schedule. He's busy. So um, finally, she uh, gives me a call. So she gave me a call on, in February, on a Friday <laughs> at 4 o'clock. And she says, hi Kelly, I know we've been going back and forth for months. Marcus is available on Monday. And this is Chicago in February, so it's snowing, okay? And she said, uh, so he's available Monday at 6. Can you make this happen? Now we're at Irving campus, and it's Friday at 4 o'clock. No one's on campus. It's impossible to get a room, okay? So I say, absolutely, we can make this happen. So she says, um, great, well, we'll see you Monday at six. So then she um, sends me another message. Oh, by the way, I need you to have at least 100 students there. So this is Friday at four, and I'm like, yep, we can do that. So what did I do? I got on Twitter, I let the, uh, a group of student uh, leaders know what was going on, and I said, listen, I need bodies. Now, my class was uh, small at that time, so I might have had uh, 30 students, but I needed 100 in this, in this room, and I had to find a room. So I get on Twitter, and I felt like Twitter could help me get the masses there, right? So then I'm like, who do I know that's high enough that can get me a room, a nice room, for, on Monday? So we got a room, and I put together an agenda, and we had this event. He came actually came from Twitter he came so um, what I did though around the episode is I built out these questions uh, of once the students were watching the episode they had to go through these questions and they were linked back to the lesson but this is just um, I do this with a lot of the episodes that I use in class and so this is just an example of the questions that I came up with for the episode but um, I use other pieces like um, when he wasn't in class, you know, we were, I'm showing him that we actually use this content in class. So also, also in this Twitter conversation, I also um, linked CNBC into the conversation. So CNBC thought it was so neat that they sent the class t-shirts, the profit t-shirts for everyone in the class because they thought it was neat. So they started following me back as well. So I just showed him, you know, we're looking forward to you coming and he's like, at Kelly R. Pope, at DePaul U, looking forward to it. So at DePaul U is our main Twitter account for the university. And they were like, how did you do this? How did you get this man to comment to Twitter? I'm telling you, Twitter works. So, um, so we had this event, Monday, January 26th. I said February. It's January, so it's even colder and snowier <laughs> than February. But Monday, February, January, tw January 26th comes. And so I'm like nervous. So do we have all the students? Did we get the room? We found a really nice room, and uh, he wouldn't allow cameras. We couldn't record anything. You know, it was just him live. And so he um, shows up. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm taking Uber down. I'm coming. So he shows up. This is the room. Standing room only, okay? And those are all the students. The students brought their parents to come see him. <laughs> Because it just, over that weekend, it just got circulated. And I only used Twitter, I did use Facebook, only used Twitter to get these people to come. And so maybe 20 of those were my students. Because, oh, by the way, I don't teach on Monday. So my class meets Tuesday and Thursday. So I had to ask my students, I need you to come here an extra day, and I'm not giving you extra credit, just show up. <laughs> so, so only about 20 of my 30 students at that time came. And um, so here, here he shows up. And so he told me, Kelly, I'm going to come. I'm going to talk for 30 minutes, and then I'm going to leave. I'm like, fine. He stayed for two and a half hours. Wow. And he just kept going and going and going. And what he did was he would pull students out of, his, out of the audience and say, tell me a business idea. And he would just drill them on all these questions. Like, you would think that it was pre-planned, but it wasn't. And the students were just amazed. And so he's going through and talking about all of these managerial accounting concepts just casually, just like off the cuff. So students were bringing their parents. 
So some people's parents were up there talking to them, sharing their business ideas. It was just unbelievable. But what I like about, oh, that's my daughter. She came too. <laughs> and so every time she sees the prophet, this is, uh, she's like, oh, I know him. I'm like, really, you know him? But I, you think you do? So yeah, you know him too. But what I like about this picture is look at the genuine look on their faces. I mean, they didn't know this picture was being taken, but they are just, they're just totally immersed in what he's talking about. And so this is all from Twitter. So this is a tweet that a student wrote. Who said school is boring? Learning business, watching the at Sweet Pete's. That's another episode that we use. Episode at the Prophet, Taylor our folks. So he put all the different handles in. And so all the um, CNBC, the Prophet, they retweeted it. And so the student thought it was really great. But all this from Twitter. And so often what we'll do is when I'm teaching any of my classes, whether it's my forensic accounting class, my leadership class, if there's an article that we're reading and um, the author has a Twitter account, we'll loop him or her into the conversation and we will tweet live. And oftentimes they will respond back. What I do often is let someone know that we're going to be discussing your article. If you could be on Twitter, just so if a student responds, it'd be super great if you could respond back. And they, they do. So it's a way to really open your class up. And um, students think it's fun. They think you're sort of cool because you have a Twitter account. I don't, um, I never follow them back because I don't want to know. I don't want to know what they're tweeting. If I, I say, you know, you need a step, a, a professional one and a personal one, I can be on your professional one. I don't want to be on your personal one. So um, that's how I used Twitter. There's Marcus and I uh, a few years ago. And what we did is we sent handwritten notes. So we sent, um, these are my students, and I encouraged as many people as I could, but we sent a package of about 70 handwritten notes to him, um, thanking him for him for thanking him to come. And so what I wanted the students to realize is, yeah, we love technology, but sometimes just a note in the mail means a whole lot. And he sent back a note, and he loved it. So just fast forward to 2017, there was a um, pilot show on CNBC called The Partner. And so what Marcus Limonis did and if you have um, on demand, it's, it's on there. So what he did is all the businesses from the profit, what he did is he launched another show um, where he was looking for a partner to partner with him to manage all these businesses. And so um, he was looking for a place to film his pilot episode. So his team reached out to me over Twitter and then they sent me an email and they said, hi Kelly, you know, we had a great time at the call. We're looking for some students to come and be a part of the uh, audience for our pilot episode. So I'm like, sure, you know, I can send a group of students and I, they wanted to film it at the fall, but again, it's super hard to find a room at this urban campus. And so they wanted the theater, and the theater had a play going on, and they weren't gonna break the, the play down for them. But, so I had um, seven students. So if you watch The Partner, you'll see these students in the audience just listening and watching and being part of the show. And this all came from Twitter. So um, be Twitter savvy. Uh, use student Twitter feeds toward class participation. So one of the things that we do when we're talking about an article um, and we're trying to engage the author of the article, I will tell them I'm looking at your Twitter feeds to see if you have added a post, added a comment. So this is why I say have a business um, Twitter account that's not something crazy. Your name isn't anything crazy. It's just your first name and nothing silly. Um, Twitter challenges. Encourage your class to engage other followers in the discussion. So it just takes the learning outside of the four walls of your classroom. Uh, look for shows that develop three core theories in an entertaining and unusual way. So I use um, Shark Tank pitches a lot. I, used, I used to use Restaurant Startup. Um, the Partner, the show that I was talking about is a good one. Um, I've used, um, of course, The Profit. And then there's some movies that I've used in the past, but movies can be um, unpredictable because sometimes there's, there's some scenes or there's some profanity that's hard to manage and control. And so I try to think about that because DePaul has a lot, we're a religious university. And so I try to be mindful of that when showing movies. And then um, short bursts, TV segments can be used during transition. So I use a lot of, um, I use a lot of TV, but I also use TED-Ed animations. Has anybody ever watched those? I use those a lot in my class. 
and um, I use my film. So I go around, like I said, and interview felons and um, have a good old time doing it. And so often I'll take students with me, um, and so we've, uh, we'll, we'll go and have these field trips. And we um, have interviewed people when they've just gotten out of jail, and I've taken a group of students to do that. And so um, one thing I want to say is um, I change my course frequently, often each time I teach, because I get bored with myself. So I change all the time. And so, you know, one of the great things about being a, a, a teacher is if you want to do the same thing the same way out of the same book all the time for the rest of your life, you actually could and nobody's going to say anything to you. But for me, I like to change a lot. So this is why these kinds of things work. Um, I haven't figured out a way to use Snapchat effectively. I know students Snapchat me, and I don't know why, but who knows what they're saying. <laughs> But um, I haven't used a way, I haven't figured out a way to use that effectively, but um, I change and try to incorporate as many new pieces as I possibly can. So um, that's my Twitter profile from a while ago. I think now, when I took this screenshot, it was uh, 902 followers. I think I have like 1,100 followers now. Not that that's a um, super big deal, but it, it's easy to have um, a Twitter uh, handle and uh, try to say something interesting about yourself. I think I've changed mine. Like I say, that I'm a left-handed CPA because there are not many left-handed people in the world, and they're all special. So, uh, tips for teaching with Twitter. Uh, I believe that it can increase engagement. Um, it can be related to your class because you can find most authors now, most writers, most journalists have a Twitter account, so you can incorporate them into your class, and you can sort of bring them in as a speaker, having them come in, and um, it can be a super cost-effective way to enhance your class, because it's free. So um, with that, um, five ways that educators use Twitter. Um, I've used it as a way to uh, create a personal brand. Um, I've begged a lot for, on Twitter for things, and a lot of the connections that I've made professionally have been on Twitter, uh, whether it's a CFO or a COO or the marketing person of a company. I do a lot of Twitter begging. Um, and what I've also learned is it's taught me to be concise. Because oftentimes my colleagues ramble, sometimes I ramble too, but Twitter forces you to get to the point quickly and be concise. And it's a great way to bring people to class. So, um, where can you find good Twitter, good digital stories if you don't want to use Twitter, if you don't want to incorporate? Um, YouTube with caution, I think. Um, I have been in a rush before and thought that it was a really good video to show on YouTube and didn't watch the whole thing, the whole thing through. And then something completely inappropriate pops up and my students think it's hilarious. I'm embarrassed, but so I say YouTube um, uh, cautiously. Netflix, there's some really great uh, documentaries. Hopefully mine will be on Netflix next year. Uh, Hulu has some really great stories about uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and leadership that's on that you can use. Um, I have a list of TED Talks that I use in my class and a list of TED Ed lessons that I use in my class. So if you're interested, just um, I'll give you my email address. But um, again, my area is ethics, leadership, fraud, risk accounting. So if, if you are talking about leadership in your classes, um, no matter the age, it's um, I think it's appropriate. A lot of times what I do is I have an 11-year-old son and an 8-year-old daughter, so I show it to them. And if they understand it, then I know it works. If they think it's interesting, then I know it works. If I can hold their attention and they can ask at least one question, then I, I know it works. So um, for the documentary that I'm doing, uh, All of Me Horses, I'll show you the, tra the trailer of just a minute when, after your presentation. Um, one of the things my daughter said was, well, how can one person steal all that money and no one know? Good question. She got it. So I, I use them as my test. So if it works for them, no matter the age that you're teaching, unless they're preschool, it should work. So I'll uh, stop here and turn it over. These are just, I've already talked about those. That's just using um, Shark Tank pitches in my managerial class. And um, my point, passing over social media, gives students access to oh, professors' data and classroom fun. So before I get started, I just want to gauge the room. Who uses social media? What type of social media do you use? Um, all of them. All of them. Could you name one? Um, I use Twitter, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, everything. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. 
at this place, Shred 415, and, I, and I'm not getting anything for Shred, this isn't a plug, but I like to work out there at Shred 415. And he's a trainer. Go to his classes. His name is Mark Byer. I mean, like, well, what about this guy, Mark Byer? Mark Byer, very interesting guy. Mark Byer started his own nutrition farm called the Mark Farm. They sell it in Whole Foods. They sell it here locally, all over the place. You can get one on, you can sell it in Shred. Oops. So I knew about this. And I'm always wondering, I'm always curious, right? I'm always curious, I'm always looking for, really, uh, to find people to come and talk to my students to inspire them. So I always wanted to know how Mark got started with these Mark bars. So I took this class one day. After class, we're in the locker room. We're having some talk, some locker room, some clean locker room to talk. And I asked Mark, how did you get started? And I mean, it is an amazing story. You know, he told me he grew up in Ohio, did his undergrad in accounting, my specialty is accounting, um, moved to California, wound up getting into fitness, and then going to culinary school. Went to culinary school, started his own catering company. From there, he got into this mark bar business. Met his wife, who's a nurse. He got a job in Chicago, then he moved to Chicago. So this is, I'm thinking this is a great story. I'm like, my students would love to hear this. You know, they could learn a lot from you. You, you struggled, you started your own business. So I said, hey, Mark, you gotta come and meet my students. So we tried to schedule a time, and it just wouldn't work. You know, he, he's a trainer, he's got his own business, he's a family man. It, the time wouldn't work, so, this is where we circle back to our good friend, Blackboard Collaborate. So at the, at the college where I was teaching, I was using Blackboard uh, Learning Management System and the Collaborate. So I said, you know what? I could set up a time with him. He doesn't have to leave his house. And we can use Blackboard <laughs> Collaborate to connect. So we schedule a time. He's at home. I'm at home. I explain to him he's going to get a link and email and it's easy to set up. Now, I never did this before. Now it wound up taking him about a good, I want to say 45 minutes to an hour to get that whole thing set up and to get us going in this collaborative session, right? So we find he's a great guy, very, very patient, very nice guy. So we get in there and he starts talking and I mean he starts pouring his heart out to the students, telling them his story, talking about accounting. I mean, it was amazing. It was just unbelievable. But guess what I forgot to do? Record. I didn't push record. So I got a whole two hours. So you got to remember, he was getting it set up for about an hour, talking for another hour. I had to tell him, you know what, Mark, I'm sorry. I, I forgot to push record. You know, so he's a nice guy. I, I, I still see him, but I don't mention this whole, you know, this, this whole classroom visit anymore. But so the point with this, I said, there's, there's got to be something better. You know, there's got to be another way. So what I came up with was using YouTube. So what I would do when I have someone I'd like to be a, let's say, for example, an online course, even a face-to-face -face course, to be a guest in the classroom, I actually, one, have my students prepare questions ahead of time for that person. I normally give them a little bit of information and then have them go on a little internet scavenger hunt and find out some more stuff about that person. Invite them in to my office, and they'll have the questions, and they'll answer them on YouTube. So the great thing about that is I know it's recording. I've got it. And um, so we're able to save it. We've got the closed captioning, so there's, there's accessibility there. And then I'm able to post that in the learning management system. So that's how I started using YouTube. A couple of things I want to say on that is uh, best practices with using social media that I've found have a strategy have a clear focus, have a goal, 
some potential uh, to achieve. In my case, it usually with social media, I use it to solve problems, right? I use it to solve problems. The other thing I would say is create quality content. And when I say create quality content, I don't just mean the aesthetics, how it looks, but think about the relevance. How is it relevant for a course? So for example, Mark Byer, his story is great for a finance course, accounting course. Oh, but, oh, okay. So it may be great for a finance course or accounting course, but it might not fit for an English course. Um, so just to, I'm gonna move through this rather quickly. This is showing you how I've set up my YouTube channel. So I actually have three channels. So I have an accounting channel, finance channel, business channel. Now, what I do for every course that I teach, I set up a playlist. So I play, whether it's face-to-face, -face, blended, online, I set up a playlist where I keep all of the videos from that course that I post. This is great because the students, if they want to, there's no pressure on them, but if they want to, they can either go back, refer to the videos in this playlist, if they they're want to see, let's say for example, I'm teaching financial accounting in the fall, they want to see what's going on in the spring, the last spring class, they can. So they can see the videos, and it creates a, an archive or a library. Also, I have different concepts that I put together, I use uh, PowerPoint videos to create my own content, and then record that and save that in YouTube for the students. Um, really quick, just so Kelly can show her, her movie. Um, the last thing is, I talk about this creating uh, a positive atmosphere. And, and one thing that always sticks in my mind when I make these videos or I'm using social media I was teaching an online course, and normally during the first two weeks of the course, it's kind of rough, because you have students, many have never taken an online course, they're getting used to the technology. So this particular course, everyone, they, they really got right into it. So I made a video, and the first thing I said in the video was like, you know what, you guys are amazing. You know, you guys are awesome, this is a great class. Now. A few days later, I go into the class. I look, we have a, a, a ask the instructor portion. In there, I saw a student comment. She said, you know what? I love that video. That was the first time I've ever had a professor say that our class, that we were good. We were doing a good job. So that always stuck with me. So I'm always thinking about that whenever I'm putting together content or addressing the class. Any discussion? I know I'm moving a little bit quickly. I'm at the warning time, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Any questions? Any questions? And um, it's uh, my co producer is Cartel Point Films, which is an organization, a film uh, nonprofit that's based here in Chicago. And um, who you're looking at is who the documentary is about. That's Rita Cromwell, and that's her horse. And so this is just a minute, so I'm just going to let this play and um, give you an idea of what's about.
So this is um, about 71 minutes, and uh, it's sort of low up here. I don't know if you guys can hear it, but uh, we did part of the loan of $53 million over 20 years from a small town called Dixon, Illinois, which is about 100 miles west of where we are here, and uh, nobody knew about it. So the documentary is about how she did it, how something like this happens, and so I use this as a basis for teaching. So even that one, one minute that you just saw, it'd be a whole uh, three hour lecture, just because it engages people and brings them, brings them in. So hopefully uh, you'll see it somewhere, wherever you're located. called The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, and it's on Netflix. That's the best one. That I've been in. Um, of course, I've used um, Enron, Smartest Guys in the Room. I used that probably like seven years ago. Um, there's another movie that's coming out called Abacus, which is very similar to All of Queen's Horses. It's about um, a family bank who the government came after. They were too small to fail is what the tagline is. That'd be out. It's actually, you can order it free order on DVD from Cartoon Film Films. Um, I used um, Catch Me If You Can. Oh yeah. I've used that one. Um, 